So thank you so very much uh, to Multiling for this invitation. It's absolutely special to be able to do this. It is also my first uh, talk, international talk, since the pandemic. Um, I've been organizing a lot of talks on Zoom and webinars, um, but this is the first one where I am the speaker. So it feels a little bit different. Um, and I also would like to start with a land acknowledgement because I am uh, giving this talk standing on the land that belongs to the Nakochtang people or Anacostans the native Algolkian people who lived in this area of Washington DC during the 19th, the 17th century. They lived along the banks of the Anacostia River, which flows from Prince George's County in Maryland and empties into the Potomac River. The descendants of the Nakochtank people are the Piscataway, and they live today in Prince George's County in Maryland. May the Nakochtank and the Piscataway live forever in these lands and may we all protect and honor the history, the people and the languages of these places. And I would like to uh, start also with a big thank you to Nicholas uh, Mararak, who is my research assistant and at Georgetown and a PhD student in sociolinguistics and he has done a wonderful job uh, in helping me prepare for this talk. Also, I have these colleagues and students at Georgetown to thank for countless discussions about COVID-19, about the world of multilingualism and the effects of the global pandemic on all of us. And many of these conversations have influenced also what I will be talking to you about today. So here we are, this is the pandemic that we're all sharing for good, for bad, and as a big challenge that has been thrown to all of us. Um, the global pandemic everywhere in the world has meant that historically oppressed identity groups are disproportionately affected. And many of them are multilingual or multilectal. For them, language is an added source of stress and strength, of vulnerability and resilience during this pandemic. So I want to explore uh, a new landscape for research into multilingualism and new research imperatives that seem to have opened up with the pandemic. I will talk about technology and I will focus mostly on digital justice and language uh, as it relates to language education especially. Then I will examine health, health justice for multilinguals and the intersections of health with language. And last but not least, I will talk about race and racial justice. And I will argue that it's at the heart of all research about multilingual learning. So the best question we can all ask ourselves in these pandemic times is how can we researchers of multilingualism respond to the challenges the pandemic has made most visible and urgent? Let me then start with technology. Of course, for the last century, the 20th century, the big trope for all of us was that technology has transformed our lives for the worse, for the better, or it has just transformed it, depending on your relationship with technology. But in the 21st century, in these COVID times, it seems that there has been a technology takeover. Millions of people all over the world are relying almost exclusively on communication technologies for work, services, study, and for socializing. And as Madi Anu puts it, there has been never such a heightened dependency on technology for such a wide range of activities at such a global scale. So let me talk about digital justice in language education. There is a vibrant research uh, tradition in computer assisted language learning and language learning and technology within applied linguistics. We have two uh, top journals in the United States and two top journals in Europe, and they're full with important research about technology uh, and the mediation of technology for language learning. Before the pandemic, the big research question that all this research basically address is how can technology support worthwhile language learning? 
um, myself, um, I started my career even before I finished my PhD with an article in language learning and technology about the benefits of online discussions for L2 learning. And I've continued this work on technology and language learning with my colleague, Marta Gonzalez Uret at the University of Hawaii, for example, in this book in 2014, where we looked at uh, how to blend technology and tasks for language learning. Since mid-March this year, all university level world language teaching has moved 100% online in most places. And this has created an enormous challenge for language teachers. So we have had already immediate responses to this, um, this question of what's worthwhile language learning. Um, and it has focused um, as the field in general focuses on uh, mainstream populations of learners. So for example, the Foreign Language Annals has published a special issue on remote online teaching and learning uh, in world language education in the COVID era. But after the pandemic, we still had the good question to ask, what should language learning look like to be worthwhile and sustainable, but now if it has to happen entirely online, and it's also worthwhile to ask, how will this 100% online experience transform language teachers in the long run? So even if we return to a more hybrid or a more physically present way of teaching languages, I believe these months of uh, full online teaching have the potential to transform the, the craft of language teachers. In our book in 2014, Marta gonzalez Yoriet and, and myself uh, talked about tasks, their relationship to language, and their relationship to digital literacies. And a point that we made in that book was that meeting the needs for digital learning and not just language learning should be considered central to good technology-supported language education. And I will return back to this idea of digital learning later on. Of course, the tasks that are now uh, up for us in, in the COVID era are uh, many of them new. So in a post-pandemic world, a worthwhile question to ask is <clears throat> how can 100% digital language learning be designed for rich critical digital literacy learning and not just language learning for all? And also what are these new uh, COVID-related tasks that have appeared because of the pandemic. But another persistent reality into the 21st century that has received less attention um, by language and technology researchers is that technology reproduces and exacerbates social inequities. This is the long tradition of uh, the digital divide, the study of the digital divide, which is as current today as it has always been ever since we had digital technologies invented. Um, the problem is one of uh, dividing the world into the haves and have nots of technology. So we want technology for all people because of the knowledge, the skills and the benefits for labor and finances, et cetera, that technology can afford potentially. But we have the have nots, many people in the world and a big, deep digital divide that makes them uh, excluded from digital technologies and its benefits. So during the pandemic, a must question to ask is how is COVID-19 complicating digital justice and digital inclusion for multilinguals? And for many multilinguals, COVID heightened digital inequities have appeared that we didn't know of before. Um, the digital injustice has thrown into sharp relief um, uh, several inequities that were always there, and it has had a huge impact on language education programs. Mostly a negative impact. For example, many programs serving the language needs of low-income adults are on hold because they didn't have any internet access or any devices to offer to their uh, students. This was the case, for example, here in Washington, D.C., uh, of the Washington Literacy Center, as my uh, colleague and friend Tomoko Tore um, experienced and related to me. 
and foreign languages and dual language programs have, have fallen to the bottom of priorities in under-resourced schools, as my colleagues Vanessa Bertelli and Johanna Barrantes tell me. They work for a nonprofit here in Washington, D.C. that promotes foreign languages and especially dual language education in under-resourced schools in, in D.C. There are some surprising silver linings too for programs actually with the move online. So for example, Rima El Abdali, one of my doctoral students was telling me that there is an Arabic Sunday school in Bethesda here in Maryland um, that has experienced a great enrollment growth um, after moving forcefully having to move 100% <clears throat> online. And now the enrollments come from families from faraway locations, not just from the neighborhoods and the areas surrounding the school. Uh, suddenly geographical distance and commutes are not uh, a problem anymore for families. And also moving online means offering fewer hours um, of education. So children are happier and there is less need for parental nagging and prodding. And so enrollments are growing and thriving in this school. So in the post-COVID era, a good question to ask is programmatic about language programs and is how will different language programs be affected differently by the pandemic crisis and what new insights can be learned from research into these differential impacts. Ever since all education moved online in mid-March in many schools in the United States and also around the world, digital access gaps are dire um, and they are endangering quality education for multilinguals. So we have reports of, for example, families where um, a student is one of seven siblings and they all share a single computer at home and uh, families who have their internet cut off because they're late on, their, on paying their bills. Um, people who have to use children who have to use cell phones for, for school work because they don't own computers. And uh, students who used to do their homework at city libraries or schools libraries because they didn't have any internet access at home or any devices, but now the libraries are closed too. So in the, in the research on the digital divide, there are three types of exclusions or injustices related to technology. And we're talking right now about the first order um, source of exclusion, which is about access. In a post COVID world, this digital justice question of access should be asked. How can schools and communities address digital access gaps and combat exclusion of vulnerable multilinguals from language education and from education in general. The move to 100 online schooling has created also new parental roles that are very dependent on majority language knowledge and digital knowledge. And so this uh, is complicating many multilingual parents in their fulfillment of these new roles. The new parental roles demand digital literacies. As many school superintendents have found out, it's not just about providing digital devices to the families. They need to create a tech support and tech engagement system and actually teach the families how to use the devices. So here we're talking about a second order um, uh, source of exclusion and injustice, uh, the issue of know-how. Uh, there is different access to the know-how of digital literacies. Um, the know-how refers to digital competencies that are necessary for lifelong learning. And the European Commission already many years ago defined it as the confident and critical use of information society technologies for work, leisure, and communication. But also surprisingly, Many parents are saying that they have learned more about using a computer and the internet through accessing uh, online education for their English language needs, for example, and that has also been useful to help their children do schoolwork online. 
So here we have an example of digital learning being an upshot of learning online. When we, when we learn online language or any other content, we're also learning digital uh, competencies that are highly valuable for any function in life and that are unequally distributed. So during the pandemic, it would be very timely to conduct studies that ask how do digital literacies mediate multilinguals participation in the online education of their children? And how are multilingual adults and children learning digital literacies together? We must consider though also the third order source of digital divide, which is positive outcomes of technology are not equally distributed. What kinds of things do we do when we use internet and smartphones uh, and mobile and social technologies? What do we use them for? If uh, we are highly educated men and women, um, as in this study, they were in Belgium and they were in their 40s. Through the internet, we may do things like finding a job, planning a trip, buying a cheaper product, um, finding out what political party to vote for, finding a potential partner online, uh, finding out what kind of a medical problem we have, or handling paperwork faster, things like taxes or invoices. For low income, low education users though, studies also document very different uses. Through the internet, they find a job also, they, they sign up for unemployment benefits and they find out about health problems and drug brands. They also find forms and information for how to file for bankruptcy or how to apply for food stamps online. And yes, they also use technology for capital enhancing purposes to stay in touch with family and friends and maintain bonds. And also to expand social networks so that they can access dissimilar others, people with more privilege, um, and that gives them access to better opportunities and information. So these are uh, real positive benefits of technology for low income, low education users of technology. What things might migrants, undocumented and refugees use technology for? Well, to connect with children and spouses back home, for virtual intimacy with extended family um, who are back in their country's origin, to see them while talking to them without having to pay with um, a, a number of free technologies that we have today. Things like sharing with other immigrants imminent threats, such as police roundups, is done through technology. And even verify TV coverage by asking back home, has there been a bombing or not? If there is a bombing, hopefully nobody died. And what new things might minoritized multilinguals be needing to do online with COVID now? They need to take care of their children schooling at home, as we saw. They have to check out health information about the virus online. Um, nowadays, many may be doing telemedical consultations online. Many may be filing for unemployment online or filing for rent relief or other relief programs that have been made available by the government. This is a phenomenon that Ellen Helsberg in the UK already 10 years ago uh, noted that public services are becoming uh, digital by default and this is cre creating a digital underclass of people who are unable to sustain digital access and cannot do the things that they would otherwise have done face to face more easily. So during the pandemic and after the pandemic, we must also ask digital capital questions. Um, how do minoritized multilinguals use digital technologies and what can research offer to ensure capital enhancing uses with positive desired outcomes of technology? So in sum, with respect to digital justice for minoritized multilinguals in a post-COVID world, I would say that all three sources of injustice and exclusion 
must be investigated. First order issues of access to technology, second order issues of digital literacies and the know-how of technology, and third order issues of using technology for desired positive outcomes in one's life. Let me then move to health. There is a wealth of research on health and language in applied linguistics. But I feel that it may be scattered and lesser known than it should be. So before the pandemic, we already have a lot of research looking at the research question of how we can foster better interpretation in health contexts. For example, we have the seminal work of Claudia Angelelli, who used to be in California, but for, for at least a decade now, she has been in Scotland. And uh, two books are very important and full of information um, on medical interpreting and healthcare interpreting in 2004 and then in 2019, just last year. Um, so before the pandemic, Another question that was already being asked is what are young language brokers experiences, benefits and vulnerabilities? And um, this refers to uh, immigrants or children of immigrants who already around the age of seven and all the way into adolescence and adulthood um, act as uh, ad hoc informal interpreters for their families. And there's a lot of literature looking at the linguistic and cognitive benefits of this uh, informal language brokering. Belém Lopez at the University of Texas Austin is one of the experts looking into the cognitive and linguistic benefits of language brokering. And uh, she has, this year, she published a, a wonderful review in Language and Linguistics Compass that synthesizes that literature. But there are also liabilities perhaps for young language brokers and research usually outside of applied linguistics has documented these liabilities. For example, shouldering the brunt of prejudice and racism can be exhausting for these young language brokers. Um, I really like a study by Shushan Anji Wang and colleagues um, and I wanted to show you this example of a 20 year old Mexican American called Anna whose family owned a food truck in Southern California. And this is what she says about her own um, needs and experiences interpreting for her parents. She says, it's always been the dirty immigration job kind of thing, the food truck. The thing is, I know people see them, my parents, in that way, but they don't know people see them that way. My mom's thinking is, I never take any assistance from the government. I am working hard, I pay taxes but I felt like you guys have a, a really bad life. And a lot of it is because you guys are immigrants. So I don't know what else to tell them. So that kind of sucked, knowing the Americans' perceptions about their business in a way kind of, I guess for a long time, I kept it hidden from them because I don't want them to know why people think of them that way. So it's, it's burdensome psychologically and emotionally to shield your parents from the prejudice and racism that you see directed at them and that you have access to through the language, through the bilingualism. In health settings specifically, health, the healthcare literature is often against children interpreters or also patient companions, not just children and other forms of ad hoc interpretation. We have a lot of studies documenting dangerous inaccuracies in the translation interpretation process and also pointing at the stress um, that the children uh, may feel because these are such high stakes um, potential for mistakes and also the topics that one may deal with in health settings are uh, very inappropriate for children to to get insights into um, applied linguists hold a different, more positive view of family language brokering, including in health settings. And uh, just this year, brand new is a new article by Rachel Showstack, uh, with six students from diverse Spanish and health with diverse Spanish and health experiences, who were volunteering as interpreters in a clinic um, for the purpose of getting service learning credits. 
And she actually points at the positive roles of interpreters um, to advocate for the patients or to provide other types of assistance as clarifiers and cultural brokers beyond interpreting. So we do have a little bit of a tension between the views about young, uh, young um, language brokers um, from the health um, scholars and from applied linguistics scholars. So during and after the pandemic, a good question to ask and a new question is, what is the impact of COVID-19 exigencies on young language brokers? Let me go back to the idea that there is a wealth of research in applied linguistics dealing with health and language, but it's scattered and lesser known. Um, we have seen since, up, since before the pandemic, um, and it's a good question to keep after the pandemic, how can health communication be grounded in local funds of knowledge and in local languages? In other words, how can we um, address communication needs in health context, not just through better majority language um, um, methods, but also through more bilingual and bicultural methods. Very important work and perhaps lesser known in the United States at least is uh, the work done by Diana Slade at Australian National University. Um, she applies systemic functional linguistics, ethnography and qualitative interviews to the study of how to train health, the health workforce so that they can learn to address patient-centered needs in their communication strategies. And uh, to my surprise, I discovered that her team had uh, published earlier this year and two years ago, research that seems really relevant to our concerns, research with mechanically ventilated patients. This is pre-COVID in 2018 and research um, uh, among nurses when they do the shift to shift handovers uh, in, in multilingual or bilingual hospital settings. So, before the pandemic, another area of research that has been um, thriving is um, studies asking what are the benefits of a multilingual healthcare workforce. Jean-Marc de Waele has uh, quite a few studies with um, his colleague Beverly Costa, who's also a psychotherapist, and they have addressed the advantages of multilingual psychotherapists um, when it comes to multilingual patients. And they see greater empathy when the sessions can be conducted multilingually. They see depth and nuance in those sessions. And also they identified uh, how important it is to, to be able to use code switching and the first language and the second language when talking about trauma or shame. And Anne Golden and Liz Lanza have a chapter in a new book this year by um, Sangeeta um, Bhagagupta and other um, co-editors. And they studied two medical doctors who were former refugees from Africa, Sara and Angela, and who were working with refugee patients themselves. They documented great empathy and insider knowledge as strengths for those doctors um, who considered themselves still refugees 30 years later. Um, they also saw that these doctors were able to be authoritative and uh, give advice in an agentive way. Uh, they were convinced also that they needed to transmit the, me the message to their patients that uh, you shall manage um, and it will work out for you if you learn to write. So they were very insistent on the value of literacy for um, integration and inclusion into the new society. They also uh, surprisingly and effectively used embodiment as a way to make it visible and palpable for their um, refugee patients, how the trajectory from the known past to the new present, um, the, the trajectory of a physical flight uh, can help them make sense of the present and motivate, motivate them and give them hope for the future. So in a post-COVID world, we need much more on this other topic. 
which is how is a multilingual healthcare workforce one of the most effective investments for global pandemics preparedness? So we have the studies documenting multilingual um, uses during health sessions, psych, psych, psychiatric consultation sessions as uh, very beneficial for the patients and for the, uh, the doctors. Um, but now is the time to conduct studies that show the specific advantages of having a much more multilingual healthcare work, workforce for preparedness for pandemics. Um, there are also efforts underway in the field of language and health um, since before the pandemic, and they should continue after the pandemic, um, on strengthening pipelines to a more multilingual healthcare force. Uh, the work of Glenn Martinez here is very important with a book that just came out this year on Spanish in healthcare, policy practice and pedagogy in Latino health. And um, he has worked with a team of physicians um, on uh, proposing medical Spanish courses online to address the pipeline problem. So the need for more physicians and nurses to be uh, Spanish speakers so that they can interact bilingually, multilingually with their Spanish speaking patients. Why is work on the pipeline needed? Um, the problem has been called the shortage of language concordant physicians and also the problem of language and or cultural incongruity between clients and healthcare staff. And these two problems, which is basically the same problem, is a disparity between the language and culture of the health clients and the health providers uh, is known to have grave health consequences. For example, in a study done by Doshi et al on obstetric care, so things related to pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum period, uh, Latinx immigrant women, particularly undocumented, felt a language and or cultural incongruity between them and the healthcare staff. And this caused three delays. Delays in the decision to seek care, delays in the identification and travel to a facility, and then delays in receiving appropriate care at the facility. There are some academic professional barriers to working on the pipeline and making the health healthcare workforce more multilingual. One is the health educators um, are inexperienced with language. And honestly, reading that literature, I wasn't very impressed with the ideas that they have for addressing the pipeline or for making um, the, the healthcare uh, workforce more attuned to language issues but also applied linguists and health educators are siloed. So this is a problem because collaborations are difficult. So in the post COVID world, I want to suggest that there is also another area that has not been explored and seems to be a new entry point into the study of barriers related to language that have to do with health. And the entry point is uh, different occupations typically carried out by multilinguals and what are their health language needs. So we know that language mediates health, whether health um, information is understood or not is largely dependent on whether the language skills, the match between where the explanations uh, in one language and the clients not being able to understand it. And it also mediates the quality of, of healthcare that is possible. But I think we may have missed something, which is that language minoritized multilinguals are disproportionately represented in certain essential occupations. And so let's think who are our essential workers. They are multilingual immigrants, and many of them are in 3D jobs, as um, Ingrid Piller called them in a wonderful book in 2016. The, 3D, uh, the 3Ds are demeaning, dangerous, and difficult jobs. Oops. Oh, did I stop sharing? 
I'm sorry, I need some. Your screen sharing is pause. Am I okay? Can someone unmute themselves? We can still, see your, we can still see your screen. Yes. Okay, okay, sorry. Somehow I got a message saying that my sharing had paused. So suddenly I got worried. <laughs> Apologies. All right, so these, um, these 3D jobs that are um, very often uh, carried out by multilingual immigrants, so-called essential workers, we know from research of so many negative occupational health outcomes, injury, mortality, or physical or psych psychiatric morbidity due to an individual's work or workplace environment. Take the dairy industry in the United States. Uh, some of us love milk. Some of us love cheese. I actually don't like milk, but I do, do love cheese. So I consider it to be an essential item for me, right? Um, we have a national survey in the US, in the US about that, the dairy industry in two, conducted in 2015. And 51% of all the labor in the United States dairy industry are immigrants. And in this report, uh, the authors calculated that if no migrants were employed in this industry, the retail milk prices in the country would nearly double. Um, the headlines since the pandemic have also shown uh, awareness that these essential workers are truly essential. And so in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, for example, there was a headline saying, Wisconsin's dairy industry would collapse without the work of Latino immigrants, many of them undocumented. Um, and the research shows that dairy workers are at high risk of occupational- Excuse lung. me, Lourdes, it yes. looks like your presentation has freezed. Oh gosh. Yes, we only see the, the screen with who are our essentials. Um, okay, let me stop sharing for a second. Apologies, <laughs> and share again. I think I think some of the messages kind of like interfere with my mouse, and then I'm clicking things that I'm not supposed to click. Okay, I'll share screen again, and hopefully, we have all will allow me to continue. Ah, will it allow me to continue? <laughs> Yes, so it was, but you, you heard me though, right? Yes, we heard you fine. Okay, so then I will just continue where I am. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I wanted just to pay, you know, to, to point at the relationship between immigrants being 51% of dairy workers in the entire country and dairy workers, all of them being at high risk of op occupational lung disease, asthma, chronic obstructive pul pulmonary disease, chronic bronchitis, and cancer. The research is very well documented on these. And so these are some of the famous uh, COVID-19 pre-existing conditions. So this, this association between multilinguals in certain niche jobs that are uh, occupationally hazardous and that put them at risk, at much higher risk for COVID-19 is an opportunity, I think, for the research on language and health um, to focus on them specifically. So I think an interdisciplinary question for the future is how can applied linguists work with occupational health scholars to address health language injustice? according to occupations. And think of this, skin diseases are well known associated with poultry processing plants. And when we sift through the studies, we start uh, seeing patterns that suggest language is important. So in this study, 52% of a very large sample of Latinx migrant workers, um, half of them working in the poultry processing plants, suffered from infectious skin diseases. And the study reports that the 21% in the sample who spoke an indigenous first language were less affected. Of course, the study didn't offer any explanation, but an applied linguist would want to dig into these findings. 
Also, um, the rates of infection and death are studied um, uh, profusely uh, since the pandemic began. And in this other study, for example, they found that among the US Latinx population, who is already affected very disproportionately by COVID-19, monolingual Spanish speakers were at a particularly higher risk for COVID-19. Um, but they were at higher risk for infections, but not for deaths compared to the rest of the US Latinx population that they studied. In that study, they proposed that the explanation is that monolingual Spanish speakers in that sample were more likely to be occupationally exposed through involvement in factory or service industry jobs. So they are more, um, they have higher risks for infection, but they're also more likely to be healthier and younger monolinguals. So newly arrived immigrants, and those are protective factors against death, not infection, but death. So we do see patterns of language affecting COVID-19 issues moderated by occupation um, and applied linguists should be in those studies at the forefront of these findings, trying to understand how language is affecting these issues uh, specifically. Uh, we do have a lot of research on workplace communication and multilingualism, uh, especially with white collar types of jobs. Uh, Janet Holmes in, in uh, Australia, Linda Yates also in Australia, the English as a lingua franca literature has done a lot on businesses and language. We also have blue collar work, um, work, work, applied linguistics work on blue collar work niches for immigrants. Uh, a wonderful study on cleaning ladies in New Jersey by Kelly Gonzalez and Anne uh, Schluter. Um, the Ethiopian cab drivers in DC uh, have been studied by Chaco. Construction workers in Qatar by Irene Theodoropoulou and Vietnamese manicurists in the US by Eckstein and Guyen. So why don't we add health to this kind of research in the workplace? It seems like COVID is really asking us to do this, to make this connection. In sum, for health justice and language in a post-COVID world, I think it would be beneficial for applied linguists and uh, scholars of multilingualism to um, approach uh, research from multi-path multi, multi strategies. Uh, first, there is a lot of existing very good research, but I feel it's scattered and lesser known than it should be. And for this, we need systematic synthesis that make these findings uh, available to the, the, the scholars of multilingualism, but also to the rest of society. We also need uh, attention to COVID-related experiences of young multilinguals and their families. Um, it would be important to engage in inter and transdisciplinary collaborations with health researchers across fields. And finally, I think it will be very profitable if we can give more attention to essential blue collar occupations as an entry point for uh, studying health and language uh, issues. Okay, race is my third point and I am getting now close to the end of the talk. Um, since the late March, so this is in the United States, this is when the pandemic really um, became known as a thing in, in the public consciousness. Um, Suddenly, the reportings on infections and deaths and hospitalizations became available by race and ethnicity, disaggregated by race and ethnicity. And this had a tremendous effect because it suddenly put a spotlight on ethno-racial inequities in health. Here's a flyer that I just retrieved um, uh, from the CDC in the United States. You see the higher likelihood for Native Indi uh, American Indian or Alaska Native uh, persons, for Asian non-Hispanic persons, for Black or African American persons, and for Hispanic or Latino persons. And you see that the hospitalizations are 
so much higher. The odds of hospitalization are so much higher for uh, American Indian or Pacific Alaskan Islander and for Black or African Americans and for Hispanics. The deaths are also alarmingly higher, the odds of death among the Black and African American communities. On top of that, on May 25, George Floyd was killed by a police officer in Minneapolis. It wasn't just a straw because there have been many cases of uh, police brutality um, um, accumulating for, for decades, but it did seem to break the camel's back. And since then we have had a social reckoning as it has been called in many media um, in all spheres of life, a racial reckoning. So it's clearer than ever before with the pandemic that race, racialization, and racism matter in the world. Going back to this um, uh, flyer from the CDC, notice the explanation that they added at the bottom. They said, race and ethnicity are risk markers for other underlying conditions that impact health, including socioeconomic status, access to healthcare, and increased exposure to the virus due to occupation. For example, frontline essential and critical infrastructure workers. So basically the public discourse seems to be embracing the explanation that ethnicity and race are just markers for other underlying conditions, such as socioeconomic status, access to healthcare or occupation that that's nothing new and that the global pandemic has put a dire spotlight on it and that race and ethnicity are nothing special after all. Can we really embrace that discourse and that rationalization? Race and ethnicity are risk markers for other underlying conditions that impact health. Are we saying that they're just proxies for greater evils? Surely the explanation is trying to address the issue that race is a social construction, it's not a biological fact. There is nothing inherently different across races or ethnicities that would invite um, more COVID infections or more COVID deaths. But it is a social construction that has been created to enable the crimes of slavery, colonialism, and capitalism. And the beneficiaries are white people, the beneficiaries of the social construction of race. And systemic racism is at the root cause of all these other underlying conditions. The socioeconomic disparities, the differential access to health, and uh, the, the possibility to work in uh, occupations that put you at risk versus keep you safe through teleworking, for example. So how can researchers of multilingualism come to accept this racial reckoning? First, we have to educate ourselves. We would have to educate ourselves in the crimes of slavery, colonialism and capitalism and in the workings of white supremacy. Then we should also search for evidence in favor or against of the claim that racism is the root cause of all other inequities. And everywhere I look and all the statistics and all the information that I gathered and which I'm not gonna show you here, um, points at, the, at racism and race, the construction of race as the root cause of um, of all the inequities. So let me give uh, an example by asking ourselves who is able to adopt the recommendations um, that are put forth um, in order to slow the spread of the disease. Well, many just cannot afford these virus averting measures. The homeless, how can they shelter in place? Families in housing without running water, how can they wash their hands frequently? People who are detained by a state, 
how can they do physical distancing? People without health insurance, how can they seek testing or treatment? People who rely on public transportation, how can they avoid large crowds? And low wage workers, how can they telework? So black, indigenous and people of color, BIPOC, are disproportionately represented in all of these underprivileged categories. And I did my research on running water and I wanted to share it with you because initially I was absolutely surprised to read that in the United States, there are families who have um, problems with running water. Um, consider these many health agencies are recommending washing hands for a minimum of 20 seconds up to eight to 10 times per day. This would mean a total uh, water requirement of eight to 10 liters of clean water per person per day. How can families in housing without running water afford this? A study by human geographers, Dietz and Meehan, tremendously um, in detail documents that plumbing poverty is not a simple artifact of income, rurality, or housing type in the United States. They say it's clearly racialized and historically produced. Racialized was the main finding. They found that living in an American Indian or Alaska native or black or Hispanic household increases the odds of being plumbing poor in the United States. Historically produced Here's an example of, of their findings and why they claim that it is historically produced. In the Black Belt, which more or less is Alabama, an area with a history of racial segregation and institutionalized exclusion of African-Americans, a black household is more likely to lack complete plumbing than black households in other parts of the country. This really tells us that the root cause and not a proxy um, of all the injustices, the root cause is racism, is the social construction of race, which was an invention of white supremacy to enable the crimes of slavery, colonialism, and capitalism. And think of another example, who ends up in desirable occupations, like being a physician versus in 3D low wage occupations. Here's the proportion of Latinx Hispanic medical students this last year. Of all the students uh, in the country, medical students, only 6.5% were Latinx or Hispanic. But think of the proportion of immigrants in the dairy industry that I just uh, talked about earlier. 51% of them are immigrants. So here we have the problem of the pipeline no access to good occupations by certain groups and they are ethnically and racially defined and um, a complete channeling to certain occupations of other ethnic and racial groups, a niche type of um, occupation structure. Black, indigenous, and people of color are disproportionately represented in all these underprivileged categories. Many language minoritized multilinguals are BIPOC, and many are also disproportionately represented in underprivileged identity groups. And let me add, because that's our topic, multilingual learning, that the intersections of race and language are also at the heart of multilingual learning. Language shapes our ideas about race and race our ideas about language. The two social categories are co-naturalized and often used as a proxy of each other for um, the advancement of discrimination and oppression. So how can researchers on multilingualism come to accept this racial reckoning? I've said already that we should educate ourselves and we should search and get to know the evidence for racism being the root cause for all other inequities. We can also look for theories that help explain the relationships between race, racialization and racism and language. 
One such theory is uh, racial linguistics in language education, which has been really um, um, elaborated upon and, and made explicit by Nelson Flores and Jonathan Rosa. Basically what they're saying is that the same ways of using language can receive different evaluation based on who the speakers are. And this is because the white ear and the white gaze is always directed to racialized multilinguals or rather against racialized multilinguals. The clearest example that I have found of racial linguistic theory in education is a study by Sofia Chaparro, a, a former student of uh, Nelson uh, Flores. And in that study, she looked at three students, but I'm going to um, draw attention to just two, Zoe, uh, Zoe and Larissa. They were two seven-year-old girls in a Spanish-English dual immersion program in Philadelphia. And they were observed over 18 months by Sofia Chaparro. Once Zoe made some progress in her Spanish, she began peppering her English with as much Spanish as she knew. Larissa also does the same thing at home as in school because Spanish is her home language, so she peppers both languages in both places. The teachers interpreted Zoe's behavior as showing her progress in Spanish, but Larissa's behavior as indicating she needs help with her academic Spanish and probably also with her academic English. What's the difference between the two girls if they're both peppering one language with the other? Zoe's parents are white middle class, college educated. Larissa's mother is a Latina working class immigrant new to the US school system and to the society. If, uh, I hope Sofia Chaparro doesn't mind my speculating and extending the story of the two girls into the global pandemic. How might the global pandemic affect the two girls now? Zoe's parents more likely um, are teleworking safely, so they are at a lower risk of uh, infection. Um, they also are able to keep their monthly check. They likely have health insurance for themselves and for Zoe. They probably have good computers and internet service at home. And they probably also are pretty savvy with digital skills. And all of this means that Zoe can have support from them for schooling and a, a set of protections um, from, from the pandemic. Larissa's single mom, is more likely to be an essential worker at risk or unemployed, if, if not an essential worker. Um, she's more likely to be uninsured. She probably has limited access to computers and internet at home. She probably has limited digital skills. And she is likely to be relying more and more on Larissa's English for health related needs and other kinds of needs like filing for unemployment or for rent relief. So Larissa is, is likely to be less helped by her mom with schooling at home. She's likely to have an additional set of um, family obligations that may or may not um, be um, in her best interest, and the whole family may be more at risk for infection. Um, another useful theory that we can look at in addition to um, racial linguistics is intersectionality. Um, first proposed by Kimberly uh, Crenshaw um, already in 1989. And basically this theory says that at the intersection of race and all other social identities, um, um, these this social identities create isms and all these isms are at the intersection um, of race and other social identities. And it is only by looking at the intersections that we can understand experiences and systems of oppression. So race and ethnicity will matter, but also class and occupation, religion, gender, sexual orientation, age, 
um, disability, ability, and any other isms that we can imagine in a particular society. Some of them are relevant and in different ways in different societies. So how can researchers of multilingualism embrace the goals of anti-racism for research? I already proposed three ways in which we must and can um, begin to embrace anti-racism for research. Uh, Suhanthi Motha has a very important, uh, compelling article this year in the Annual Review of Applied Linguistics. And she uh, cites Ibram X. Kendi, a Black author, um, saying, the opposite of racist isn't not racist. It is anti-racist. One either allows racial inequalities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequalities as an anti-racist. There is no in-between safe space of not racist. The claim of not racist neutrality is a mask for racism. This is a really, really important um, point that we may or may not accept, but at least it deserves very deep thinking. How can researchers of multilingualism embrace the goals of anti-racism for their research? I think we must set up the research under the starting assumption that race matters. Given the enormous evidence, the onus should be on demonstrating that it doesn't in our studies. Not, the onus is not on others to show us that racism matters in our studies. The onus is on us to be showing in our studies. If we think it doesn't matter, we need to provide evidence. So in conclusion, I started by saying that the global pandemic everywhere in the world is disproportionately affecting um, historically oppressed identity groups, and that many of them are multilingual or multilingual, and that for them, language is an added source of stress and strength, vulnerability and resilience during this pandemic. So the real challenge ahead for me is to see whether we can collectively reimagine the future of research into multilingual learning after the pandemic. And race will be at the center of it all. Thank you very much. And I hope the question answer period allows us to interact around these topics. Thank you.